a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the Films at Home podcast. Today, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite audio platforms, I appreciate all the support here. Today, we've got a great episode with Fran Simeone from Radiance Films. Now, Fran worked at Arrow for like over a decade. I think 12 years he was at Arrow and he took all of that knowledge and experience and he started his own label, Radiance Films, uh, about a year ago. They've got like a dozen, 15 titles, I believe, at this point. Some of them are UK exclusive. Some of them are available in the US as well. But he's built out a really cool label with some unique packaging, tons of movies that have never had a Blu-ray release before, like worldwide Blu-ray premieres coming out of his label. We got crime movies, you got comedy, you got drama. He's working on some horror stuff. I mean, he's just creating one of the most unique and exciting new labels that's come out in the physical media world recently. So I was very excited to talk to him. He has tons of great insights on this industry and, you know, shifting in in formats and talking about the business side of things as a, as a small label, like how they do things, how they remain profitable, their business, you know, case and their story. So very, very interesting and definitely a label that you guys should 100% check out and support and fran was fran was great super knowledgeable so i think you guys will enjoy the interview but sit back relax here comes the interview and then i'll grab you at the end for the outro all right everyone so here is our interview with fran simeone from uh, radiance films fran thanks for joining us today i really appreciate the time you've been doing awesome work for for many years in physical media and i'm very excited about radiance so thanks for joining us today um you want to give a little introduction a little background on who you are what you've been doing in your in your career and um you know what radiance is all about yeah absolutely thanks for having me on firstly um and for the kind words um so yeah so i started radiance um nearly a year ago coming up to a, a year next month um before that i was at arrow films so i was director of content there for 12 years um Arrow was kind of like my second step in the industry. I started out working for a cinema company. Um, So I worked for cinemas doing kind of, well, I actually started out doing accounts and did um, marketing and events and all kinds of stuff um, for um, two previous companies. So I kind of worked on that side of the industry, always a big home video fan had a vhs collection had a dvd collection and um you know saw these labels kind of doing great stuff and i was always into like the extras and the booklets and the packaging i you know i loved everything about it so i was in the industry but home video was very separate like the 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 two worlds never met no one from one side knew anyone from the other so it was it was hard to break in and then um uh, i basically just you know, dug away and, and kind of found this opportunity at Arrow. And um, it was great. You know, I was kind of thrown in at the deep end because having never worked in home video, I wasn't exposed to masters and the technical side of things. And I was really thrown in at the deep end, but I absolutely loved it. So I did that for a long time, worked through some of my most favorite films, um, got to do some amazing stuff, got to great festivals and, and so on. And it was a, it was a really awesome time. Um, but after 12 years, I, you know, that's a long time to be anywhere. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, was thinking about what else I could do. Um, but also I just kind of was getting to the point where I was passing up opportunities and things that I wanted to do on a personal level that didn't really fit with the company, the company's ambitions or maybe the company's curation and the way it was changing. And um, I, I, through the pandemic, you know, as I suppose many people did, they kind of turned them, their lives upside down. So that's what I did to myself and my family. And, <laughs> and here we are. And um, Radiance, you know, in terms of, you know, talking about the company and what it does really sets out to, do things that other people aren't doing i mean obviously there are a few things where people sort of say oh but you know we've got other fukasaku titles and stuff and yeah that's absolutely true you know i've got to pay the bills so you know there's (laughs) there's a few things that you know will be familiar i'm i think i have to have a certain degree of things that people are going to recognize otherwise i'll i'll never sell a single unit 
Um, but, you know, I've been lucky so far in that some of the things have, have really hit with audiences, like Big Time Gambling Boss has done very, very well, you know, both in terms of sales and um, the connection with fans and the reviews that it's gotten. Uh, my first release was just in the UK, Working Class Goes to Heaven, likewise. Um, and then, um, you know, there have been others as well, like Welcome to the Dollhouse also sold out. Uh, Man on the Roof is really doing very well. That's out now. Um, so, yeah, it's been great. And, and and that's what I kind of want to continue to do, to kind of shine a light on these things that people may have heard of or mm-hmm. might have seen somewhere or, um, you know, had a theatrical screening but never had a dvd or whatever which is the case for a lot of films i'm doing um that's what i want to focus on you know i ended up and i see it a lot in the industry which is which is great for people who are into it but it's just less my kind of thing it's like you know the fifth version of something you know i did that a lot before um for me who's working on it i'm kind of like i already did this you know kind of i ticked that box so now yeah. I'm, I'm interested in in ticking new boxes so that's what we're doing yeah, and I think it is. It's it sounds like it's working. I know that a lot of people have been talking about these releases, and it's it's cool to see that a lot of them are Blu-ray premieres too. Like you're talking, like that is that's the super exciting part for me is that you're bringing a lot of new stuff, whether they're world Blu-ray premieres or you know at least Blu-ray premieres in in the UK or certain countries. Like it's it's pretty exciting to be able to get these these new movies that we've never had before on a solid physical format. So, I mean, is that, is that something you think you're going to keep focusing on is like bringing those, those undiscovered movies to, to Blu-ray and DVD? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I want to continue doing. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of other companies, you know, doing stuff that we're all familiar with and and, and doing that to a very high level. So I don't think we need another label doing that. Um, I, I, in my career, I've done that as well. You know, I, yeah. I worked on big, you know, amazing movies and it was awesome. And it's great to kind of, you know, be amongst the bits and, you know, the poster or the stills or the master itself, you know, to be in that in, in your favorite film is, is, is great. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, career kind of experience stuff, I, I did that. So now for me, you know, when I <laughs> watch a, really terrible copy of something you know on youtube that's taken from a greek vhs or something um and it's and, it, and it's a film i think oh this is great and then you see that through the process of then being restored and then coming out on blu-ray that that for me is you know an equally awesome journey so that's that's what i'm excited doing now and um you know if the, if the fans are, are kind of willing to to go along with the journey with me then you know that's definitely what i'll keep doing yeah, no, I th- I think so far, like you said, a lot of these have have sold out. I think they're all, you, you're sort of the the structure, is sort of that they're all like a limited edition, right, with a certain number um, to be sold. Is that something you think you'd you'd keep doing as well? The sort of, I mean, I, I assume as a smaller label that helps with just like being able to figure out costs and be profitable, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's. It's just that I can't keep these things in print forever. Like, you know, a few right. people have said, oh, you know, I like Criterion because you know what you're going to get, whether it's day one or day 500 or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's great. I wish I could do that, but I can't. Yeah, I, right. you know, I'm a very, very small company with very limited means. So, you know, for me, it's just about being upfront with the customers to sort of kind of say, if you want the one with the case, with the sleeve and the OB strip and the booklet, then we'll make this many and that's kind of appropriate for the market. Um, if I could keep those in print forever, then, you know, I would, but you yeah. know, this is just the reality of the market as it is now. So yeah, for me, it's just about being upfront and, and not trying to kind of gouge anybody. Like when I said recently, I, I went online and said, you know, that the quick sellout of um, welcome to the dollhouse, you know, kind of points towards 2000, not being enough. So we're going to up to 3000 for any kind of UK exclusive. Um, mm-hmm. If it's a UK US, then that's 4,000 total. That probably feels okay for the moment, but it's something we'll keep monitoring. So, you know, I'm going to be flexible. It's not like it's only ever this much and ha ha suckers if you miss out. It's, right. it's something we'll keep evolving. So it's just about, you know, us being in the right place, you know, from a financial and forecasting perspective rather than, 
you know, anything else. Yeah, so no, that makes total sense. I think it's smart and it's good that you're being transparent about it too, because, you know, there are those, there's those, you know, limited edition copies that, you know, just sell out and then, you know, it's almost becomes like the scalping game online. So yeah. it, it's nice to hear. Yes. If you're selling more than you, you would adapt because, you know, that's, I think that's the last thing any of us collectors want is the whole, you know, let me find it on eBay for three times the cost just cause you know, yeah. somebody grabbed a bunch of them and decided to try to make a buck. I mean, it doesn't, it's not good for anybody. So I, I no, appreciate exactly. the, the transparency of, you know, upping that up. And if for those big releases, if that makes sense, I think that's a good idea. Um, but you know, you mentioned the team. What what is the team like? I know it's small. What, what is it? You know, is it primarily you, or do you have a, a small team that you work with? Um, well, there's a few regulars. I mean, in terms of like the actual staff of the company, it's very very small. It's just kind of me and a designer. But we have mm-hmm. um, technical um, manager Stephen Horn, who's been with us from the start, and he oversees all the technical stuff. Um, then we have um, a series of producers and editors who are kind of in and out on projects. Um, as and when the, the project fits them. So Tom Mez has kind of done a lot of the Japanese releases so far. Uh, Kat Ellinger's done a few of the Italian titles. Um, I've worked with uh, specialist people on a few other projects. So I worked with uh, Elijah Drenner on Welcome to the Dull House. He did a few bits on that. Uh, I worked with, I'm working with Hunter Stevenson at the moment on OC and Stigs because he's like the world authority on OC and Stigs. So it was, you know, it, any project I choose, I kind of think, well, who's going to, who's going to, you know, bring all the expertise, bring all the knowledge. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm doing with the producing. So it's nice in that without a, a kind of set staff, I'm able to, to go out and say, well, who's, who's going to be best for this and, and just do that. So having that is a bit of a luxury at the moment, actually. Yeah. I mean, being able to pick the specialist for each one definitely makes sense. That's a, that is kind of nice. And, um, you know, how, how do you go about, the the restoration work is that um is that outsource i mean i i guess i'm just fascinated with like you mentioned you know some of these movies they're like on youtube with a a greek vhs transfer like what is what is that process like when it's a very small team to just like try to go find a source for these and like that that journey it feels like indiana jones looking for like these lost movies a bit when i talk to people about it i mean is that is that what the process is? It just feels like you're searching for treasure sometimes. It can be a bit like that. Yeah. I mean, everything so far has been pretty okay. I mean, there hasn't been anything that has been, you know, really Indiana Jones. Like, I mean, there are kind of Indiana Jones, like investigations going on, um, but they're not going to see the light of day because they are like that. So they could be like years in the making. So, Actually, from the Berlin Film Festival this earlier this year, I was there and I'm doing one of these kind of archaeological style digs for this <laughs> film. And, and it was a film that when I started Radiance, I, you know, I had this big list, but this one was near the top. And I thought, you know, this is great. Have to do this. And found the rights holder and negotiated a deal, got very close they started to agree. We said, okay, great, let's meet in Berlin to kind of finalise. And um, when I got there, they basically said, look, you know, we do really want to do this with you, but we haven't got great news. And that is that when they went digging for the material, um, when they had to pull it out of the lab, they then had to uh, show their paperwork to prove that they own that material. And that's when they realised that paperwork is not up to date. So um nothing can continue until they saw that out which is going to be quite a long elaborate legal process um what we then found out in addition to that was that because this film has um quite complicated special effects that's all other lab work which is going to mean that it's incredibly complicated and would almost certainly push it way out of budget so then what we have to do is not only solve the paperwork but then find somebody to help fund it because it's going to cost a huge amount to restore so they're still committed to the project i'm committed to the project but now it's just got all these other layers so there's things like that that are happening all the time so you know in terms of like complexity of projects that is quite rare that doesn't happen a lot um but for some of these other things like um working class goes to heaven um we had a good base in the restoration that we were supplied and then we went back to it and we did some additional work. So we did uh, additional 
uh, color grading fixes and other technical fixes. I mean, everything that we do actually has some kind of TLC, like we'll do some work on it. I mean, I think there's only a handful of films that we've just sort of said, this is great, let's just use that. Um, like Miami Blues, we did additional cleanup. Um, Welcome to the Dollhouse was great. That was all good. That was straight through. Um, I'm struggling to think now. Yeah, like um, Filler Up with Super had slightly dodgy grade. You know, one of these, you know, a lot of people are talking about this, like either you've got a slightly too yellow tint or you've got a slightly too blue tint. So yeah. that's something that we're quite careful on. So we'll, we'll look at that and sort of make corrections and find reference to, you know, a, an earlier version that, you know, was more correct. Like Working Class Goes to Heaven is a good example. Um we were able to find a print reference for that that had a couple of scenes which had just been neutrally graded and they were actually like bathed in this like blue light from like TV and uh, we were able to fix that. So it's the first time it, that's been available um, in, in that sort of correct grade. So in terms of the restoration, it is more like that in terms of making fixes than going from scratch, although we are doing our first from scratch restorations right now. So we have... Um, a Halloween title which we've just received scans on so we're getting all the reels in um, awesome. and that's going to go through full restoration um, and then we have another title which is already scanned and hopefully that's going to equally be for Halloween and kind of signing on the dotted line and delivering and everything all at kind of once so that's quite exciting and quite a big title as well so that um, makes it even more so um, so yeah and there's more of that to come I mean we have um, we have another couple of titles at least this year and then a couple of titles early next year that we're going to restore as well. So for me, it was just, it was probably not the smartest choice to be restoring so quickly as a new label, but <laughs> it was just about the films and kind of like not being able to say no, like mm. the better of me, the, the kind of, um, film fan got the better of me. It was kind of like, but it's so good. It's like, just yeah. do it. And it's, and um, yeah, so hopefully that'll pay off. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. You know, there's, there's nothing better than kind of taking the ball by the horns and, and, and having those projects kind of be done right from scratch. So that's really good. So the Halloween, you got a couple Halloween, we talking like, like horror movies for Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. So actually okay. my Halloween slate burst out of Halloween. So, uh, there's going to be a horror title in September and okay. and then like all horror for Halloween as well. And then some other kind of stuff, um, November, December. So, okay. Yeah, horror centric uh, over, over the, over the period. And, um, and then, yeah, like back to a good mix and then we'll yeah. see. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm, I do, I mean, I've always said, because I think in our video, I think a lot of people assume like I was like a real horror aficionado but i'm really not i'm not a horror bro or anything like that like i like all genres like i do like a lot of horror films but i'm not i'm, I'm not one person for any one genre i, I like a bit of everything so yeah. um, there'll definitely be horror titles from radiance so i'm looking at quite a few horror titles but it's all going to be very radiance if you know what i mean so um mm -hmm. yeah that's exciting as well i do like dipping into different genres i know it's been a lot of crime so far uh, i do like crime but yeah a bit of comedy a bit of horror so you, you have me think like were you part of it, it reminds me a little bit of like what arrow tried to do with like arrow academy but then they sort of stopped doing that and i wonder like was that was that partially were you involved in that because it yeah, feels like I mean, it's, I it's a little bit of that like everything basically um but um when i started at arrow uh arrow video had been going for about a year and it mm. was it was um masters of jallo and then it was yeah i think that was the only tagline but then there was that and then that wasn't on other releases and then it had done caligula and then it mm. had done um maybe something else i can't remember there are only a few releases out and i just sort of thought this is all a bit like bit of this bit of that like make up your mind and i said what well, if you just keep doing horror you're going to scrape the barrel because at that time like licensing big horror films from studios just wasn't common so i thought if you're entirely independent it's not going to be long before you kind of run out of good horror films so yeah. i was thinking quite um 
within a, a sort of smaller remit back then as the industry was. So I said, look, broaden it out to all kind of cult films. Like if you like, you know, if you like the thing, you like Big Trouble in Little China, which is not really a horror film. It's right. It's a mix of genres, but you know, that, that holds true. You know, you, you, you're going to want to expand to that. Otherwise you're limiting yourself. Why would you do that? You should bring in black exploitation films and bring in, um, you know, spaghetti Westerns and all this kind of stuff that could be done. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, okay. So we did that. And um, <laughs> we brought those genres in and we did battle Royale later that year. And, and that's what happened. Yep. But the company owned all these art house films. And, um, and I just sort of thought, well, these are, equally great films but we don't want to leave them behind we should do something with them um but at that time the audience was sort of very horror centric and Mm. there was i think we we used to use a forum called cult labs and i think we raised it like what would you think if we did like lady diabolique the cluzo film which is a horror film and there was a very negative sentiment towards that so it's kind of like okay well maybe we should just do this other label so Mm. that's where academy came in but as each label grew and Arrow Video constantly got um, all the kind of big stuff, like I remember we put all the handmade titles on Arrow Video because they were culty and they were big and they needed the bigger budgets and the more selling power. So we did with Nail and I. And there was a bit of a backlash to that. It was like, oh, no, these are big movies. They should be somewhere else. Yeah. But that just made Arrow Video stronger and stronger and stronger. And Academy just kind of always got left behind. And eventually it was just like, what's the, what's the point? It's all just one thing, just merge it all. And I think a lot of labels are doing that now. Um, yeah. You know, Criterion once upon a time didn't focus so much on genre films. Now they have all these Jackie Chan films and so on. Um, you know, the same is true of a lot of companies that just have a much more diverse mix. And I just think that's more representative of the audience that we have nowadays. Yeah. Which in turn, I think has made me more confident to do Radiance and, push the boat out right yeah that makes that makes sense so i was wondering if there was something you had pulled from your time at arrow because it does it does feel like you've got a really good mix which is fun like you know every time you announce new titles it's sort of like where you don't know it's going to be horror or it's going to be crime or it's going to be you know comedy whatever it is like that is kind of a fun part of this label i think is that you know you're you're just surfacing great movies that people will enjoy regardless of you're not locking yourself into a genre, which is, which is nice and, and really kind of refreshing. Um, I am a big horror fan, so I'm, you know, of course I am like overwhelmed with how many horror labels there are, <laughs> but there aren't as many people giving that level of like care to stuff outside. It feels like horror gets that level of care all the time. And there's several labels doing the horror stuff. But that same level of care doesn't necessarily get done for these these other genres. So it's that's where Radiant, I think, has a real has a real opportunity here um, as a boutique label. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and what really inter- I mean, the titles I have coming up for Halloween are, are sort of more traditional horror, let's say. But mm-hmm. I'm looking at films for next year, which sort of some people might say a horror. Well, you might read it and think, "Oh, this sounds like a horror," and then. The thing is, is that you could say, yes, well, they are horror, but then when it comes to it, it's actually really kind of not. And I think that's, in a way, the most exciting thing because you can think, okay, yeah. you've got a film which plays with horror conventions or plays with horror narratives and does something completely different. And that's, for me, that's really exciting and, you know, what an interesting way to, to kind of experience a film that's entirely different. Um, I guess uh, when I was thinking that, I was thinking of Possession, you know, which is, a yep. film that you know a lot of people will talk about you know in horror circles but isn't sort of traditionally a horror film in that you know in terms of horror tropes yeah. more of a genre bender than you know just yeah. straight horror which honestly those are some of the best you know horror movies if you want to call them horror it's those ones that kind of yeah push the limits on other other genres um so yeah i'm i'm you've got me excited for those those coming up but how many um how many do you have on your list? Like what's your li- do you have this long list that you're still working towards yeah. kind of a long runway here? I it's very long, yeah. I mean, I, when I started I made a list um of everything I thought that I could kind of investigate and and look at some short term I know where that is, I can definitely get that and some long term 
you know, I'll dig for this. And that was yeah. 800. And um, there's been a lot that's been knocked off that now because someone else has released it or I found that it's, you know, not available or whatever. But then I keep piling stuff in. So, yeah, it will kind of, it will kind of go up and down around that number-ish, um, maybe a bit lower now. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I just kind of – I'm always reading, I'm always watching – always you know listening in the extras just just now actually just keep seeing one of our discs and going over the extras and thought oh yeah i must add that to the list because that looks really good and that you know sometimes doing the work is the best way to get the recommendations it's sort of you're talking about one thing and then suddenly you think oh yeah let's look into that that sounds yeah awesome. mm-hmm. no that's great so i mean t- Sounds like you're not going anywhere anytime soon. You got a lot of work cut out for you. Um, yeah. What's the uh, What do you think the release cadence would sort of be for for Radiance? What can people expect? You know, is it monthly? You know, how, how many you're trying to get out realistically in in a year? Um, in a month? I mean, I think it's going to be quite short term in terms of figuring that out. It's going to be quite reactive because I'm mm-hmm. such a small company. I can be really nimble like that. Yeah. So even just this year, I've kind of gone up two and then up to three and then down to two and that is just as much kind of what i have in stock what i can actually get out the amount of work i can get through um but it is just entirely sales led you know the more people buy the more things sell out um the more i can keep piling in um so yeah for the moment it's probably going to stay around that kind of two three mark to the end of the year and then probably continue for the early part of next year um where i will go up is is going to be box sets um okay so for me in terms of production it's very sort of disc based so whilst people might look at it and say oh there's only one extra release or there's no extra releases but if one of those releases is like a three disc set then that is more so that's where the more is going to come from for me because i've got too many box sets like three or four box sets already for next year so um that's that's where the the uplift is going to come okay so that's i think that's totally fair considering how you know the size of the team if you can get two or three out each month i mean that's that's awesome and you know with 800 on the list looks like you're set for uh quite a few years (laughs) so you got you got your work cut out for you but it's, it's exciting to keep going and you know, you're right. Being able to be nimble is, is kind of neat. Like, you know, you can expand or contract if you need to. And as long as the people show up, right, you can keep, keep getting this stuff out there. Um, yeah. one thing I wanted to ask. So I just, I, I was telling you before we started, I just got my first radiance release, the Sunday woman. And so you, you have this very unique packaging that I've never seen before, right. With this little, it's like a spine, I don't know it's what to Obi strip. Okay. So it's where it comes from uh, Japanese CDs and vinyl. Okay. So I'd ne- I had never seen this before, but I think it's super, it's a super neat way to do this. So that's, you, you took that from Japanese packaging. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was never a collector of Japanese CDs, but that, that is where they originate. And then I found them on, on vinyl that I was buying uh, from like Mondo and Death Waltz and people like that. Mm-hmm. And I always um, hated uh, J cards for steelbooks. They really annoyed me. Yeah. Um, and I I get, do you get rid of them? I get rid of mine. I did some and then I didn't others. And that's what annoyed <laughs> me. I constantly yeah. felt like trapped in the middle. Like some I just rip them off and just be like, I don't need that bin. Right. And then others I'd think, oh, but it's part of the packaging. And. <laughs> I have to, what do I do? Do I leave it on? And then it, they fold off like this. And they never right. stay. Ugh. Um, so I thought, well, I want what they represent in that they, you can just be taken off. You get lovely, clean, minimalist packaging. Um, and I thought that's, that's, I need to do that. That's what I want to do. And I just sort of thought of the OB strip and thought, can it go in the sleeve? And then it's in place and there's no glue and nastiness. And, um, maybe even aesthetically people like that to my surprise they actually do um but the main thing was that you could get everything that you need to get on there for films like mine that nobody's heard of you want to get some awards in there some basic information on what it exactly is the right. key thing for the uk is the bbfc um which we have to have on the front and the back and right. 
for any US releases, we just take that off, but this principle is the same. But the nice thing about the OB strip is, and this is very much a conscious choice about that J card thing, was that if you have it and you take it out, you don't just need to bin it, it will go inside. Mm-hmm. And you can keep it nicely and put it away. And there's none of that kind of aggravation that I had with the J cards. So I, right. I was able to kind of tick that and um, and hopefully people, well, people do seem to be enjoying it so far. Well, so, I, yeah, I thought it was super, I was going back and forth. I was like, I don't know if I want to take this off. Cause I really <laughs> like, if I was gonna, I was going to put it on the inside. Cause I had seen you recommend that online and, and made a point of like, this will fit. Cause that is always the struggle. I'm like, these, these stupid cards don't fit in the case. So I have to either, yeah. I got to toss them or I have to keep them with the glue on and everything. And then they end up falling off anyway. So yeah. I was going back and forth. Um, but I also like for the for the UK audience those I've heard from so many collectors they hate those big ratings logos that you have to put on them yeah. so it's a super cool way to sort of like it's on the the slip but you could actually get it off and put it inside and now you have that clean look which yeah. I do feel it, it's I can't imagine being you know graphic designer in the and you do this beautiful package then you got to stick this huge you know label on it i've always been like oh they i hate that they forced that and they put you gotta put it on the spine and everywhere else it just you know sometimes it kills the aesthetic so that was a neat way of i think like getting around that which is kind of cool i I know the collectors in the uk that i've talked to have appreciated that very much yeah i mean me too i mean i i do kind of feel sensitive towards the design of things and you're right you you think oh why is that there funny it wasn't yeah so that was a a big relief for me to be able to kind of get around that yeah smart but i I, and i love the clear case always a good choice i mean that's a i I don't know it has that uh it's a little arrow it's a little criteria and it's a little you know it's radiance it's its own thing which is nice yeah um, I do appreciate that. It's got a nice premium feel to it. I mean, like I said, it's the first one I've had is this Sunday woman, but, um, you know, and I just love that, you know, you presented this one too. I thought this was interesting. It's got both the 133 and the 185. So 133 is the original. And then you also had the widescreen option. So how does, how did that work? Like, how did you have to go about doing, I guess, two different transfers essentially? Well, it's the one transfer because when every a film is scanned, you scan the whole film area, and then um, then you basically oh, just cut it away and, and, and restoring whatever you need. So uh, with this one, um, it's always been presented in Academy One Three Three One, and um, we were looking at it, and it was pretty clear that it, it should have been One Eight Five. So we talked to a few people, tried to find reference prints, none of which could be found because the film didn't really seem to have a big release. We ended up finding out the producers were very strongly thinking that a broadcast was going to be very big for them. So they had a TV aspect ratio in mind. Um, but um, Luciano Tovoli, the DOP who did Suspiria and, you know, loads of classics and stuff, he was obviously shooting at 1851. So we, you know, made the call and, and decided to present it that way and kind of got confirmation and everything. And, um, and that was it. And to be honest, I think you can kind of watch it either way. Um, and it works. I mean, that's just down to totally being great really, but, um, either option is fine, but yeah, officially one, three, three, one is, is kind of the original. So we wanted to have the option there. It just kind of felt right. No, I always appreciate, you know, whenever they you can get, you know, director's cut or multiple options or I'm a sucker for like the TV edits of movies sometimes too. I don't know why. It's just there's there's something about, you know, some of the edits are so funny and it's, you know, the way they had to make it for TV. I, I always think like Halloween and Halloween 2, the TV edits of those. I watch those quite a bit because I, I remember watching them on TV. Um, but it is, I, I love getting, you know, you, you're giving everybody every option possible, which is, which is great. And I mean, this thing is loaded with features. I mean, a ton of special features. So how much of that, how much of that did you guys do on each of these releases? Like, do you take on a lot of that and create them? How much of it is like archival stuff that you you go out and find? Like, you know, talk a little bit about that and that process. Cause I think that's a big part of radiance is like, 
yes, films presented in their best, you know, best possible presentation, but also loaded with features, great packaging. I, I, that's a huge asset. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's very much about um, having all the extras on there that are appropriate and interesting and not kind of doing things for the sake of it. So with any release, it's about looking at what are the things to talk about and almost having that as a checklist. So, um, you know, the first thing is archival because not everyone's going to be alive. Not everyone's going to be available right. or, or even willing to talk about things. Sometimes like in the case of the Sunday woman, we did reach out to Jacqueline Bisset, but just never got a response. I mean, she doesn't appear to be doing very much. So it's not really much of a surprise. Um, obviously, unfortunately, uh, Trantinia died recently. Not that he was going to do anything anyway. Uh, and, and likewise, uh, Mastroianni is not around as well. So you kind of already at that point, kind of know you haven't got lead actors but we yeah. did manage to find uh, a short archival interview with Trent with Trent and Young so we got that um, and then we wanted uh, something on the um, something on on the film itself but with a sort of very um, with a, a knowledge behind it so with all the extras that we do uh, wherever possible we'll get someone who has a very high knowledge of that country's culture or, um, or, or a knowledge of, you know, some of the source work from the film, again, either culturally or, or if it's like a novel or something like that. So in this case, it was Richard Dyer, who spends a lot of his time in Italy, um, who saw the film originally in Italy. It was never broadcast or theatrically shown in the UK. He's written on Italian cinema, very, very knowledge knowledgeable. Um, so he was able to, to talk about the film in a really interesting way and, and kind of bring all that knowledge to it. So that was really important. Um, and then, you know, as I say, it's a case of, of going a, across everything. So it's like, okay, so we can get Tovali. So we, we knew that we could get an interview with him, which was done a few years ago. Um, and, and it's the same for, for all the releases really in terms of going through that process and, and finding all the things that are going to fit rather than sort of saying, Oh, let's get three interviews in the commentary and and just kind of filling it up in that sort of arbitrary way of like what will sound good mm -hmm. and rather it's more like these are the things that we'll, we'll address and let's just get those done like big time gambling boss has only got two extras on it but that's because everyone's dead and you know there's only yeah. so much japanese writing that you can get there's only so many topics you can talk about so for us, it's it's quality over quantity for sure. I mean, you say that you know some, and some of the releases have got loads of extras on, but yeah, that's because those those films or releases just happen to have a good variety of things to talk about. Um, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, sat around queue seeing stuff that I think is boring that I know customers are going to get and go, well, that's a bit disappointing. You know, right. I'd rather people look at the specs of release and think, huh, not a lot of extras, but come away from that release feeling like it was all good. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately that's going to, that's going to win out in the end anyway. Oh yeah, for sure. No, there's, you know, there's plenty of, uh, I don't know what you call them, filler special features out there, which yeah, I've been like, okay, two minutes in, I'm like, yep, I'm good On to the next one, you know? So mm -hmm. quality over quantity for sure is, is the smart way to go. Um, do you guys have any plans? Everything's been Blu-ray so far. I've got to ask. I mean, are there plans to potentially look at like a 4K UHD format in the future? I won't say no. Um, but the, the reason that there aren't any now and, and aren't any at least earmarked is because the films that we're looking at are much more niche. They don't tend to be restored to that standard. Sure. Um, I'm also a little bit wary because... I'm not really sure where where really to situate radiance because the my experience of doing 4K is with Arrow. And so with Arrow, everything was top notch, you know, no stone left unturned from a technical perspective. Um, I just don't know that I can do that both from a budget point of view and really from um, – an appropriate budget level for the films I'm doing. Like it's one thing to do that for a, you know, a huge genre movie and another thing to do it right. for an obscure one. Um, the other thing is, is that I think 
the industry as a whole doesn't seem to be too settled on on what constitutes a kind of market um what's the word i'm looking for a, a kind of standard a market standard of what a 4k release should be so we're, we're seeing releases with hdr without hdr um right. you know various levels of quality across the board and i just I, i'm kind of unwilling to to kind of get into that until i think that becomes a bit clearer i mean I, if i was doing one today i would do hdr but i know there's plenty of releases without there's questions over color grading which you know become even more pronounced with hdr as well Yep. So I want to kind of address all that and get into get into a position where, you know, I can be really confident. I don't want to push a product on customers that they're, you know, maybe not going to be 100% satisfied with. So I think in time, potentially, and for the right film, definitely. Yeah, I was going to say, it's got to be, I mean, the cost is significant too. I know just doing an HDR grade of something can be, I think that's why a lot of these don't, have hdr grades sometimes from the smaller labels because that is a huge huge it cost is, yeah. um from what i've heard so it makes sense i mean honestly what you're doing is you know these movies don't even have you know blu-ray releases so the fact that we're getting it is is huge and i do i, I know there's those <laughs> there's people out there in my comments all the time they're like yeah it's not 4k i'm not buying it and i'm like oh my god that mindset is to me so crazy because that means you're only buying about 800 movies that exist on 4k and the other uh, million you just ignore, like, you know, there's, there's the Blu-ray format is still great. I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's excellent. And, you know, the market, I don't know what you saw at Arrow, but like, like you said, that 4k market is still very small, very niche on, there is no standard. And even, I mean, we're eight years into that format now, right? Like it's still sort of floating around in the air. So I get that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of hit or miss with that format too, which, you know, I've seen in doing different reviews. Some of them are, yep, incredible, amazing. Some of them are like, yeah, you know, you could probably buy the Blu-ray and, you know, it's 99% the same experience. So, you know, is it worth the the cost? is is problematic i mean yeah in the early days of, of doing 4k's at arrow we were shocked to find that um a lot of the competitive releases out there were, were faulty and everyone was just like yeah well that's the way it is right um, you know some studio releases like yeah this won't play on this player and it's like okay yeah that's just the way it is yeah. and i think it's just down to the the format not being 100 percent stable i mean Perhaps it's something where the technology has still got to uh, catch up to the to the discs in a way. Um, the players have to catch up to the discs, perhaps. Um, but um, yeah, crazy that that can even exist, really, as a consumer product. So yeah, because that, that's a scary <laughs> that's a scary uh, concept, really, to deal with. You know, as a manufacturer. Oh yeah, I mean that is it. It is kind of. It is insane. Like the the discs were far ahead of e- even the TV technology. I mean, if you bought if you bought a 4K TV in like 25, uh, 2015, 2016, I mean, compared to what they are now, it was it was not giving you the best experience for your 4K discs. And we still, yeah, there's still players that won't play a double, you know, dual layer 4K discs well. And it is just kind of it's a crazy thing because nobody's. I, I don't know. I, I guess that's just the shrinking market, but nobody's really like stepped up and been like, Hey, we need to fix this. Um, yeah. So I, I don't blame you at all. If I, you know, I probably wouldn't mess with it either. If, you know, unless I knew I had, um, you know, top gun Maverick or something, it's like, okay, no brainer. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do it. But you know, for this stuff, I think it, from what I've seen still looks great on Blu-ray. There's no real need in the consumer, the average consumer, I'm sure you see this, but is, still dvd blu-ray is sort of a you know a next step up for a lot of people 4k is not even really on the horizon except for the most hardcore so probably from a business sense it makes a lot of sense too right absolutely i mean i think it's it's difficult sometimes for fans to to sort of understand that the market as a whole Mm. um is still really not knowledgeable i mean I, i i'm delivering stuff all the time you know the press discs or whatever and I was in the post office and someone said, well, what's in the package? And I said, oh, it's Blu-rays. And they were like, what? I said, right. oh, DVDs. And they went, oh. 
DVD is, yeah. I don't know, some people just don't know what a Blu-ray is, you know, and this is like, you know, years and years into the format. And right. some would say the dominant format, but you've still got people out there who don't even know what it is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, that is that is a challenge. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a part of... I've been trying to just like, I realized it a few years into doing this, the YouTube content and reviewing discs. I was like, oh my, nobody knows what a Blu ray is. Never mind, you know, they, we call them 4K DVDs, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, the Blu ray term doesn't, and people come in my room and they'd be like, wow, what an, you know, look at all these DVDs you've got. And I'm like the nerd who's like, no, 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 actually, they're, you know, they're mostly Blu ray. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're like, yeah, whatever you say, like it's a DVD. So, I totally get that. And, you know, I think, I think you're, you're definitely on to something. The 4k, like you said, if it makes sense, sure. But what you're doing is great. Just, you know, these are world Blu-ray premieres, which I don't think people maybe, maybe that doesn't resonate with everybody, but like, that's a huge deal. Like first time in the world, you could own a physical copy of this movie on an HD format. I mean, it's 2023, right? These movies are, some of them are 40, 50 years without this or longer. It's, it's crazy. So yeah. I appreciate the work you're doing because it, it is important for it's important as a, as a collector, you know, I want them just for my own purposes, but like preservation wise to like all the stuff you're doing is, is super important for, for film preservation and film history. So I think it's a, it's a great thing. And I'm glad there's, I'm glad you jumped on and did your own thing. Cause a lot of these probably wouldn't have seen the light of the day without you. Thank you. So, yeah. So where can, uh, where can people find you? I know we've got, we got Radiance Films um, in the UK, right? So where's where's the best spot? You can buy them right from the website there in the UK. Where's the best spot in the US to, to grab the stuff to? So I do have a US website, but we're not selling from the website. Uh, so it just basically points to Diabolic DVD. That's okay. best to me if people shop there. Um, we're on Amazon and, you know, the usual yep. places you can buy discs if you, uh, if you search for our titles. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, head over to Diabolic, check stuff out. They also sell some of our, our UK stuff for people who are region free, although we mm -hmm. do make things region free where possible. Not always yep. is it possible. You know, studios do demand region coding a lot of the time. So, uh, so yeah. All right. Diabolic DVD. It is. is that the best place if, if people business wise. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it, I yeah. probably it's up there. Um, you know, cool. I know that Diabolic are going to look after their customers as well. You know, oh, yeah. it's really good stuff turns up undamaged and timely and so on. So, right, yeah, and I think that's the best choice, really. Cool, and I know you're all over. You're on Instagram. You're on Twitter. You're on all the the social platforms. So, we will uh, we'll make sure to link all of that. And get people over there. Support these releases because it is an, it's important work and. You've got to support the work as the collector out there and the, the, you know, the, even just film enthusiast, hopefully, you know, even if they've, if they've never bought a Blu-ray before, this would be a good place to start. Like yeah, there's, absolutely. you know, these are, these are some deep cuts that a lot of people have probably been looking for for a long, long time. And you, you probably can't find most of them online either. So. No, um, you can't. I mean, we do have digital rights. We will release some of them. Um, but yeah, many of these films have, yeah. Completely impossible. Yeah. This is it. So well, this is the time. If you're out there listening and you haven't bought a Blu-ray yet, this is the film fan in you needs to go out and look at Radiance. But you guys are doing great work. I'm really excited to see, you know, what comes next and when's the uh when's the next release? Some early early May, right? You kind of been doing them at the beginning of the month, right? Yeah, beginning of the month. Um hopefully all on track for May third. Um okay. so that'd be good. Um yeah and yeah if we can squeeze anything else out we'll try um but yeah usually early early month awesome well i really appreciate the time today thank you thank you for the insight on the the label and all the information on it and it's i i tell people every time i i learn something new every time i talk to people and you know you've got the experience and starting your own label i give you huge props it's not an easy thing to do so congrats on all the success and hopefully there's more coming thanks very much jeff yeah, anytime. All right, everyone. So that's our interview with Fran. Fran was awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you learned something. I hope maybe you go out and support Radiance Films now after hearing, you know, his story and all the work that goes into this stuff. But they are really doing some unique things in the physical media world. And, you know, it's a small, small team. But the fact he's able to crank out, 
you know, two to three releases every month and they're looking at box sets and they've got, you know, like you mentioned, like 800 titles, you know, on his list that he wants to keep doing. And, you know, his, his business is, is doing well, but we, you know, let's make sure we support it. And if you guys have a title, you know, I I would never say like, you have to go and buy everything. Nobody buys everything, buy what you love, but go check out his site, go check out Radiance Films, check them out on Diabolic DVD. If you find a title or two that you enjoy, I definitely would recommend them. Like I said, I, in the interview with him, I just got my first title, the Sunday woman, uh, from Radiance Films and the packaging is great. That little slip is awesome. It, you know, is, is minimal. You can take it out. You've got reversible artwork. You've got a ton of features on here, a 2k restoration from the original negative. And this is a world Blu-ray premiere. It's a movie that never had a Blu-ray release anywhere in the world was not easy to find. And Fran and Radiance, you know, resurfaced this thing for a whole new audience. And that is always very exciting. The, the film preservationist and archivist and you know historian in me that you know the reason why i collect this stuff is is for things like this so go support them all the links will be in the video description the episode description on spotify apple wherever you are if you enjoyed this episode make sure you subscribe on youtube and follow us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode of the podcast we got tons of great guests lined up here for the next few episodes as well so don't miss any of those and if you like the content i always appreciate a like on youtube or a five-star review on your favorite podcast podcast apps that helps us reach new listeners. So thank you all for your support. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.